Guys, the holiday season is upon us. It is the season of giving, but sometimes it's nice to treat yourself. And that's exactly what we've done. We've added some seriously cool specimens to our internal collection recently. And today we want to share them with you guys. I have no idea what's in these boxes as per usual, but I'm super excited to find out what is in these boxes because I've seen a couple spreadsheets, I've seen some certificates, so I know that they're really spectacular, but I haven't laid eyes on any of these specimens before. So let's jump right in. Uh, I've been told to open these at the same time, so. What? Wow. Whenever I see something like this, I find it hard to believe that it just occurs in nature. These are blue raspberry flavored, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, well, what's what's really cool is this part looks kind of matte, like there's not a whole lot of shine to it. But then this part has a lot of, I guess it's a druzy quality and a little bit of sparkle to it. This one doesn't really have any of that. It's got like a sunken hollow part in it, uh, which is super cool. So these are two very different specimens of the same type. They're both aragonite. Aragonite gets its name from the region of Spain, Aragon, which is where they were first discovered. But these guys come from Afghanistan, which is wild because Afghanistan isn't known for this. You can find them, uh, actually, I think there's only like three caves in the whole world that are Aragonite caves. And you can actually pay a little bit of money to go in there and walk around and take a look at everything. So one cool thing about the Aragonite that you'll find in these caves that you can walk through is that you don't find stalactites or stalagmites of aragonite, but rather you find these urchin shapes of uh, aragonite formations. So aragonite occurs in the orthorhombic crystal system and it's actually a polymorph of calcite. So polymorphs we've covered on the channel as well a few times. Gemstones are polymorphs of each other if they have different crystal structures, but the same chemical composition. It's a different kind of box, so I'm ready for anything. Oh man, I, this is, it's like you guys knew I was gonna be on today. This is one of my favorite types of minerals, it's fluorite. Fluorite occurs in the cubic crystal system, but that doesn't mean it has to always be in the shape of a cube, but it still has these remarkably flat, smooth faces. It just occurs like that. That's one of the reasons why fluorite is one of my favorites. It just, it always looks I, like the shape is just something man-made or like it was machined or tooled with something. And this one has really high color saturation. It's deeply purple. And it looks like it's actually kind of nestled on like a spiny little bed of quartz. I mean, loads of little spiky quartz crystals with nice termination points and they're super uh, glistening and glittery. Fluorite can be purple, fluorite can be blue. Fluorite can be just about any color of the rainbow because it is what we call allochromatic, meaning it does not have a chemical in its composition that inherently gives it color. Pure fluorite is colorless and it gets its color from outside imperfections or geologic conditions, but nothing in its chemical makeup that makes it fluorite gives it a color. It's got perfect cleavage planes, I believe four of them, which makes it a little bit dicey for uh, jewelry and you don't often see it faceted, but I don't think you have to facet fluorite because <laughs> nature faceted this one for us. And, oh, this one's from China. I've seen, I've seen a lot of Chinese fluorite and China's definitely known for some spectacular fluorites. All right, let's see what we got in this one. This is I have the same reaction as the as the aragonite. The color is crazy. This is dioptase, but it's on shatokite. It comes from the Shattuck mine in Bisbee, Arizona, which is a very famous uh, copper mine. Shattuckite is part of the orthorhombic crystal system. Look at these like little concord grapes, all uh, kind of tucked in with the dioptase. It's very lustrous compared to the uh, the shatokite. So the shatokite is, and I don't mean this in a bad way pretty dull in, in uh, luster. But the dioptase definitely has faces on it, on its crystal. So dioptase has a hardness of five. It is part of the trigonal crystal system. Dioptase gets its name from the Greek words for see-through, basically, which was in reference to the visibility of its internal cleavage planes. They're a beautiful, vivid green, which is kind of telling of the environment that they tend to form. They tend to form as secondary mineral deposits in copper mines. So dioptase, despite it having a five a hardness of five, it can be and was ground up uh, and used as pigment. And in fact, some statues, a set of statues, a set of three, uh, were found dated to 7200 BC and their eyes were colored with dioptase. Um, so that is really cool. Hair check. Okay, this is cool because I've been given a rough specimen as well as a faceted specimen. So this is 
she liked on Muscovite mica specifically. So we've got our rough and our faceted right next to each other. This is really cool. So this is a 91 and one half, don't forget the half, carat faceted shelite. Shelite occurs in the tetragonal crystal system, which is kind of why it looks a little bit more orderly. One of the industrially significant things about shelite is it is a very important ore of tungsten. So shelite often occurs in tin bearing veins. So it was, shelite was first described in 1751 and it is named after a Swedish pharmaceutical chemist named Carl Wilhelm Scheele. Basically discovered what oxygen was. So shout out Carl for helping me know what is up with breathing. Okay, so we've got another box. I was about to say one more, but I hope it's not our last one. Add one to the list. Are you kidding me? The hexagonal crystal shape, the irregular hexagons, the termination points, and of course, the rich purple color suggests to me that this is amethyst, the famous purple variety of quartz. It is one of the most popular stones in the world, and that's because it looks like this. <laughs> These are all beautiful examples of that terminated, uh, six-sided trigonal crystal. Craft Bandicoot would go nuts for these things. You can heat treat amethyst to get citrine, which is that famous yellow variety, which this uh, she like kind of looks like. If you would like to know more about it, we've covered it a ton on this channel. So you can check out some of our other videos or go to our new website, gemstones.com, which is a great place to learn about not only amethyst, but also aragonite and shelite and fluorite and dioptase. And you can actually see in, in these crystals, there's like variety of color saturation. And that purple color actually comes from iron in this instance. It's a popular coloring element among uh, a lot of gemstones. All right, I've been told to close my eyes, so that's what I'm gonna do. Oh, more fluorite, absolutely. So you remember I was talking about fluorite being part of the cubic crystal system. Here are those cubes you ordered. Personally, I love cubic fluorite. And I also like fluorite that you can kind of see into, so you can see the color zoning. It's not, like I was mentioning with the quartz, there's like pockets of color, and it's not all just solid saturated purple throughout. This is so crazy saturated. The body color of this sphalerite is orange, but it's so, it is so, ridiculously saturated. It's, you can't even tell that it's orange. So we've got fluorite, which are the big obvious purple cubes, and it's they're sitting on a bed, a huge bed, a Hawaiian king bed of sphalerite, which is a beautiful gemstone material, but it is notoriously difficult to facet because it has, it cleaves very easily and it's very soft as well. It's not very hard. But like the fluorite, I, I mentioned earlier that fluorite is a four on the Mohs scale of hardness, but to add to the difficulty of faceting sphalerite, it is even softer than fluorite. If you do manage to facet it, the rewards are, the reward is great because sphalerite has crazy high dispersion, meaning that the light goes in, it gets split into all the colors of the visible spectrum and those separated colors expelled from the gemstone and you can see them all individually. So that's, you know, that's one of the famous optical effects of diamond is that dispersiveness, that fieriness. Well, sphalerite is even more highly dispersive. Once more with eyes closed. <laughs> wow, these are huge. I'm gonna say that this is calcite. I've never seen calcite this transparent and this big. So dog tooth calcite is so named because of its resemblance in form, but it can form in way more habits than just that. Over 800 recorded crystal habits for calcite, which is a preposterous number. One of the really impressive things about this specimen, so calcite is pretty soft. It's a hardness of three, which means I can almost scratch it with my fingernail. I will not attempt to do so. So what makes this specimen really crazy is despite that hardness, that low, low hardness, the faces of this calcite are really clean. Hardly any like breakages or chips on the faces of these crystals. Despite it being super soft, it's very lustrous. So one of the contributing factors to a gemstone's luster is how hard it is because the harder a gemstone is, the finer and higher degree of polish you can apply to it. And despite that, these faces are super clean and highly reflective and, and, and lustrous. You can see it if I kind of move the specimen a little bit. If aragonite sits at temperatures above 300 degrees Celsius, relatively quickly, like sometimes within a few days, it will turn into calcite and no longer be aragonite.
but that's possible because they're polymorphs of each other, which means that they have different crystal structures but the same chemical composition. You kind of see what appears to be doubling of the things that you see inside the calcite, whether it's fracture or inclusions or cleavages, and that is because calcite is highly refractive. High-grade calcite was actually used in World War II for um, bomb sites, anti-aircraft sites, and gun sites as well. And I've, I've actually even heard about some recent experiments uh, into incorporating or using calcite to create some kind of invisibility cloak type thing, which I guess would be a pretty interesting use of the refractiveness of calcite. Um, I would like to have a word with those guys though. I wanna take a closer look today, guys, at this calcite specimen um, because I want you guys to see the internal doubling that high refractiveness uh, creates in certain gemstones like calcite. So let's take a closer look at this big boy. Super jazz that we got to share some of our new collection pieces today. Sometimes it's nice to treat yourself. Have you ever treated yourself to some gemstones? Let me know down in the comments, or really just to anything that you've treated yourself to recently, that you, that you, maybe it was a nice dinner out. If you have any more questions about some of the specimens that are on the table, or any of the other specimens that we've seen on any of our unboxings, leave a comment down below with a question, or even better, head to gemstones.com, uh, our new, brand new spanking website, which has information on calcite, fluorite, fluorite, amethyst, aragonite, scheelite, and uh, dioptase, and shatakite. No, but go check it out. It's a great website, awesome resource if you wanna learn anything about gemstones. And of course, don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss out on our future videos. Thanks for watching.